Dr. Bernardini, and he's talking about Terra Bruciata. Thank you. Ah. It's not a, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. So, did you hear the news? Some researcher at, uh, I don't remember which university, discovered that, that software has bugs. They will get the Nobel for the obvious things. <laughs> Seriously. I guess you are not surprised, but uh, I think that you should be. You see, four years ago, Robert Dewar wrote this article that you can find in, um, on the network about why we shouldn't put with software glitches. In the, this article, he point out, points out that we accept in software, a quality that is, is usually much lower than the quality we accept with other stuff, say cars, TV, or uh, microwave ovens. Why is that? Well, he says, and uh, I agree with him, that the problem is uh, mostly cultural. And it's uh, nicely summarized in this slide. Bugs are like bad weather. Annoying, but you know, a fact of life. And uh, since they are annoying, but a fact of life, people accept them. You will not accept a car that suddenly stops in the middle of the road, but you accept a, a software that gives you a blue screen of death. Yes, it's annoying, but you know, there is a turnaround, and what can you do? This uh, is usually my reaction. Okay, usually I'm not that aggressive. But uh, more or less the idea is that blue guy here made two mistakes. First, the word annoying. Bugs are not annoying. They are dangerous. When uh, I started making this presentation, I researched uh, a while for in, um, in, net, in the net for bugs that had some serious consequences. And uh, the situation is pretty scary. This is just an, an excerpt of the, maybe the worst one. I guess the in my opinion, the scariest, sorry, the scariest one is the first one. Termac, Terac 25, a machine for radiotherapy. If the user acted too fast on the uh, interface, the graphical interface, a risk condition caused an excessive dose of radiation to the patient. And uh, look at the Wikipedia entry. The, 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 the entire description is pretty scary. Uh, second one, I guess it's the third in that list, uh, an intended acceleration that was a bit controversial. Uh, the car maker said that the user was making a mistake, pressing the accelerator instead of the brake. Then it was the mat that... Uh, uh, stop the, the accelerator, but uh, in the end it seems that it was uh, a memory corruption that caused the throttle of the accelerator stuck full open. Okay, I understand, I understand. As uh, an Italian commercial says, uh, ti piace vincere facile. That is, uh, you like an easy win. You did some kind of uh, cherry picking, you did. 
I mean, you choose a medical device, you choose a car, those are serious stuff, dangerous stuff, and an error in a car is dangerous. Okay, but what about, say, a music player? I mean, what kind of harm can you get from a bug in a music player? Okay, please enter the, uh, the last uh, the bug in uh, 2015. Two researchers demonstrated that it was possible to take full control remotely of a car by going through the entertainment system. The entertainment system was bugged, they hacked that, and it was connected to the bus of the car. They were able to control everything, wheel, accelerator, brakes. And uh, the last one, it was in 2016, uh, there was uh, a wave of Daniel service attack done, di done di by Mm, sorry, done via some um, IP cameras. The worst one, it was uh, an attack that uh, sent a tsunami of data of one terabit per second to, the, don't remember the target. And uh, so the message, especially in the two last cases, uh, is this. Even if your device is uh, harmless, a player, a camera, a bug there can be dangerous at all too because it can trigger some more serious stuff and it can be used as a way to attack something. That uh, is especially important now that the Internet of Things is getting fashionable. And... Uh, and this explains the strange video at the beginning. How can a toothbrush bring down the power grid? Well, it's easy. You have a toothbrush connected to the internet. They exist. There is a big brand who is selling them. Don't ask why. I, don't, I cannot understand why you could want your toothbrush connected to the internet, but they exist. If they had a bug, they could be enrolled for a Daniel service to, say, the power grid, the stock market, or whatever. So, sorry, too fast. So, uh, at this point, one could say, okay, 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 you sold your point. Bugs are dangerous, are serious stuff, but you know, they are unavoidable. So they are not really like bad weather, but like more meteors. Dangerous, but you know, you hope that uh, it never happens. And maybe you can have some kind of passive defense. Do backups uh, or build shelters in case a meteor strikes. Actually, even the word unavoidable, okay. And the fact that the, um, this idea is changing is reflected here. This is a piece of news uh, that, uh, about a bill that uh, was proposed in the US in order to secure the Internet of Things. So they recognize that, they, that the bugs here can be dangerous. But look what uh, they do. They ask that the software is patchable. They are not asking for software that works. They are asking for software that, that can be patched because the basic idea here is that bugs are a matter of life. And even this is not true. The usual current example is avionics. A 787 has seven, eight millions of lines of code. How many lines of code flew over our head so far, and there is not a single incident that brought to a death of someone due to the software. So, yes, 
the usual objection is, okay, it's possible to write uh, good software, but uh, it's expensive, it's time consuming, and since it's time consuming, we cannot do that because we need uh, to be fast, fast, fast to get to the market. Two counter objections. First, uh, that's not an excuse. You are, uh, there is my life at stake, so if, uh, if uh, it's expensive, too bad, I'm sorry for you, but uh, you, you are going to write a good software. And second, it seems that it's not really so expensive as many believe. Uh, talking with someone who works uh, with uh, the 0178, uh, that's uh, the certification standard for software that running on uh, planes. Uh, I was told that uh, if you do the things correctly, and that's uh, a, good, uh, a big if, uh, that is, if you rethink your process in order to comply with that standard and do not try to, do a glue, to glue the standard of your process, the increase uh, on expenses is more or less maybe 45, 55%, not 200 like sometimes you hear. Okay, 50% is a, a, it's not negligible, but it's not even. So, oh, so huge. So, okay. Software, good, uh, good software can be written, it's, it's important that it's written, but uh, nobody does that. Ha, what are you going to do? What I'm going to do? Welcome to Terra Bruciata. Terra Bruciata is the Italian expression for uh, Scorch the earth, that strategy where you burn everything so your enemy has no resources. And the idea is to burn the ground around the bugs so they have no more place to hide. More precisely, my vision, as your PHB would uh, say, uh, is uh, to bring process tools, ideas from the high um, integrity software context into the open source software context. It will not be easy. The uh, high integrity stuff was born in the industrial environment. So for example, the 0178 was born in the industrial environment. And uh, in industry, you have uh, a hierarchy with your boss. Your boss say, Starting for tomorrow, we are going to do it this way. You say, why? Because I'm the boss. And say so. If you don't do it this way, you're fired. Maybe many management books would not suggest this uh, strategy, but it can work. In open source, of course, you cannot do this way. In open source, uh, we, the open source communities are run mostly by volunteers in a distributed way, so it's a different environment. And trying to adapt something born in an industrial environment to this one, maybe it's a bit challenging, but we can try it. Why? What uh, I think to achieve? Well, three objectives. The first one maybe is uh, the most obvious, but not the most important. To produce better software, which you know is something that's uh, a good in itself. I mean. But uh, the second objective is uh, to is to uh, make an example and show other people that this is possible. So my idea is, try, is the, I hope to, you know, to attract to this idea other open source communities. But also, I think that it will be important, uh, let me say this, uh, to let uh, know everyone 
that uh, writing good software is important and possible, even without being a, a software house that works for Airbus or Boeing. This uh, should be known not only to technical people like us, not only to your C-suite, but to everyone. Because uh, what we want is a kind of market pressure. People must get uh, enraged when uh, the game gives the blue screen of death. And uh, finally, an interesting side effect is that uh, uh, we most probably will need to develop processes, tools, uh, and a uh, way to use some sophisticated tools like uh, formal checking in a precious context. And uh, this experience, uh, these tools, uh, could be used by other developers, open source or not, to help producing better software. So this is not really... Let's say that uh, the main objective is the second one. The first and uh, the third are nice uh, side effects. So I told you about uh, the why. Bugs are serious stuff. The what I want... Uh, people to write, uh, sorry, I hope, uh, okay, uh, the why, bugs are serious stuff, the what, I want uh, to distribute, to uh, promote an idea of correct software. Remember that uh, Robert Dewar said that the problem is cultural. Here we are trying to address the root of the problem. Okay? And now let's uh, talk a bit about the how. So what kind of software we are going to develop? My idea it was to start with uh, something quite peculiar that is uh, libraries for network protocols. The little devil there uh, was added today while I was uh, at the, uh, the ADA developer room and I saw a talk about uh, using ADA in uh, little uh, embedded uh, environment. And that could be another interesting uh, team. But, you know, uh, we start staking with the original plan, and if we get enough uh, people, attract enough interest, we can start also this branch. This is just uh, was added uh, four years, uh, four hours ago. Okay, so the idea of starting with network protocols is quite peculiar, I admit. But there is a reason. Actually, there are two or maybe three. The first reason is that networking today is very important. Another uh, nomination to the Nobel for the obvious stuff. Uh, actually, many people believe that uh, programming is just web development. So we can uh, agree that uh, networking is very important. And it's useful to have some safe implementation of that. That's because of interesting. Actually, there is more to that. The networking part of your application is uh, the entrance gate of your application. So, and if your gate is weak, you can build a castle as strong as you want, as you want but uh, the whole system will be weak. So, And uh, moreover, what's worse, uh, if you have a library with uh, bugs uh, that is used like a, a network protocol as a building block, uh, 
This library will be used in many applications. And uh, if there is a bug, you will have lots of bug around. Do you remember Heartblad? That's the same idea. So since we need to start from somewhere, this could be a, an interest, uh, a, a, let's say a, a context where we can do a very strong impact about safety. Moreover, there are another couple of reasons. There are a couple of reasons. Uh, that's, uh, let's say, we try to get uh, two birds with a, a stone. And uh, that could be, of, uh, could be useful also for um, protocol development. You know, uh, the IETF uh, has two tire for protocols. One is a proposed standard, and the other one is an internet standard. In order to be promoted to internet standard, they need at least two different implementations of the same protocols. Why? The idea is quite obvious. If you have two different independent implementations, the word independent is important, that talk each other, then you are quite sure that the specification and protocol are not ambiguous and complete. What happens usually is this. While the protocol is being developed, someone writes a library for that protocol, some, writes some software for that protocol. Because uh, in ITF they believe in running code. Correct. And uh, uh, so at least one version of the protocol is available. Starting from that, in many cases, if you need another uh, library in a different language, you don't rewrite the same library from scratch, but use the first one, usually written in C, and do a, a binding, a binding. And you know, if you have a Ruby binding for a C library, that's not an independent version. It's the same code with a different address. Since in our case, uh, we are interested in developing correct software, we have a reason for rewriting the stuff. And as a nice effect, we can get an independent implementation for promoting the code to the higher tile. And uh, moreover, ITF has, is trying to have some connection with uh, academia and with open source communities. They have started uh, this uh, initiative that's called CodeStand. CodeStand uh, is uh, basically a um, way to connect, uh, to propose some project uh, to be implemented and keeping track of who is implementing what. This is the home page of CodeStand. As you can see, really not many uh, belly whistles, really to the point. And uh, I don't know if uh, someone of you have ever been in an ITF meeting. If you want uh, to have an idea what an ITF meeting is, uh, take force them and make everyone 20 years older, <laughs> you get the ATF. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a very, very special uh, group. <laughs> Still working by a mailing list, uh, I guess they, they are the, the, the last ones who, <coughs> sorry. They, they are the last one who still uh, work and communicate via mailing list, but uh, it works. They bring uh, and uh, staying at uh, ATF meeting is something that one should go just to see the environment. It's uh, and this, for example, is a code request 
code requests. So these uh, are open teams for someone who wants to try to develop this stuff. And uh, we could be a nice uh, channel, channel between open source and ITF. Let's say this is not the most important uh, result, but it's a nice uh, side effect. Okay, still uh, staying on the side of uh, how, let's go a little bit technical. And, uh, and this is something that uh, I feel like in the need of uh, explaining maybe a definite bit. So the idea is to develop this stuff using, if possible, Spark and uh, ADA. By the way, Spark has nothing to do with Apache. It is a subset of ADA that's suitable for formal checking. Formal checking means that you have a piece of software that can check uh, if uh, there are no, say, no buffer overflow, there are no exception, you use everything uh, when uh, it's uh, be, have been initialized, but also you can have uh, the program to formally prove that, uh, say, your function actually does what it, uh, it says to do. You write, uh, say, precondition, postcondition, and the, co the as part can check uh, that if the precondition is true, given the code, the function, the postcondition will be true. This uh, can help a lot, actually, uh, helps a lot uh, in finding bugs. That's uh, the idea that I have about terra bruciata. This uh, is a way to burn a lot of ground. It's, uh, it will not burn all the ground. There, is, there will be still something that you can do in Spark, something that you need to do with testing, but this can help work quite a lot. And uh, the usual objection when I talk about ADA is that uh, it's old. Uh, I'm not going to do an advocacy, um, an advocacy of ADA now. Uh, usually here in Fosdem there is a da the ADA developer room. You can go there and uh, uh, for more um, deep discussion. But basically the idea is that uh, actually I use a lot so far I was gradu I graduated more or less 50 years ago. And uh, in all those years, I used, I don't know how many programming languages. And uh, I used C, C++, and other stuff. Uh, my personal experience is that uh, the bugging with ADA is much, much faster. Let's say that the one tenth of the effort Really, if uh, you help the compilers, helping you, it can be really, really a, a, a strong help. It's not a magic ballet, of course. Usually the objection is uh, that uh, uh, the real quality comes from the programmer, not from the, uh, from the tool. And uh, it's true, I agree. But you know, even a chef that needs to do some, something complex like filleting a fish, prefer to use uh, the flexible knife because the job is done faster and maybe with better quality. So even if you are a professional program programmer, you have a lot of experience, you will prefer to use a better tool that helps you in the job. Basically, and uh, uh, believe me, uh, okay. Uh, the other objection usually is about speed, but other uh, is compiled like every other language. So, more or less, there is no. Uh, and actually, it can be used on very small devices. A few years ago, here in Fosden, there was uh, a. Um, 
talk that showed uh, the Lego Mindstorm programmed in ADA in order to make a, um, an inverse pendulum, a segue. And it was uh, a multitasking code in over the Mindstorm that is 16-bit uh, CPU with, uh, I don't remember, 64 kilobits of RAM, stuff like that. So it's not only something that runs on planes. And, uh, well, this objection, I guess, uh, it's not. Uh, uh. So, what time is it? Okay, a little bit uh, early, but I guess. Okay, uh, what is the, sta the current status of this? This is a quite a young idea. I got this idea maybe less than one year ago. Currently, I'm working myself with a couple of students of mine that should graduate uh, in the next few months, so I will be left alone. And uh, I started uh, with trying to implement co-op. I don't know how many of you know co-op. Co-op is uh, a lightweight uh, HTTP. It's very uh, in the spirit of uh, HTTP, but uh, it's uh, based on uh, UDP, not TCP. And uh, it's uh, all binary, while uh, HTTP is text-based. This is all binary. And this uh, uh, was developed for the Internet of Things, as usual. Why this? Honestly, no special reason. We need to start from somewhere. This is uh, connected to Internet of Things, which is uh, important nowadays as applicative level. So we started with this. We are currently trying to get from the uh, RFC a, a, to uh, summarize it in a uh, few formal statements of requirements, and from that starting developing with more or less the idea that you can find in the 178 minus the, all the bureaucracy that uh, the 178 has. And uh, so the idea here is to try to collect uh, at least initially a condensation core of people that can be really interested in uh, the idea of writing correct code. So. Uh, uh, if you want to get in touch with me, here there are my email address, my LinkedIn page. There is also a LinkedIn group, and uh, uh, maybe, uh, all, oh, not maybe, there is also a page on SourceForge, but uh, I forgot to put the link here, but uh, uh, I guess you will be able to find it. And uh, I hope uh, here there is someone interested in this stuff. So it's uh, something that's starting. So it's open to new directions. So it's open to commenters. It's open maybe the idea of using or writing network protocols maybe can change. I don't know. If there is enough uh, uh, convincing arguments, maybe it can change. Maybe we can start also different branch, for example, in uh, embedded or other stuff. And uh, that's it. I am open to questions if you have uh, any. I guess I'm a little bit early, but uh, I think you will not cry. Thank you very much, first. And here's the first question. Yeah, hi, so I'm Yannick Moy, uh, uh, project leader for Spark at uh, Decor. Uh, so I have one question and, and two comments. So uh, my question is, uh, how did you make your slide? <laughs> and uh, uh, my, my first comment is about what you said or what somebody told you about uh, building Avionic software that costs only 50% more than uh, uh, regular software. Uh, just, just to dismiss any misconception that that's not true at all. Uh, so uh, NASA documents uh, some years ago uh, um, counted something like seven times more uh, investment in verification phase uh, with respect to development for this kind of software 
And even last week, I was uh, at uh, um, Avionics Conference, and Airbus presented the big project to reduce the costs in DOM 78, and they were saying that for their typical products, verification was 70% uh, compared to development 30%. And uh, I could go on about all the uh, development assurance that you need. It's much more than, uh, than just 50%. Just so that you know, okay. uh, high, uh, high critical software uh, really requires much, much more. So you, uh, you cannot just copy paste uh, such processes. But it's nonetheless, uh, my last comment is uh, uh, obviously we are very supportive of um, a project. We use uh, the kind of technology that are used in avionics and other domains. Uh, uh, just wanted to say that uh, even though Terra Bruciata seems like a good idea, uh, these kind of initiatives uh, in individual projects have been going on for, for many years already. And for example, uh, I encourage you to look at Muen. Muen is a separation uh, kernel written in Spark. It uh, was uh, uh, led by this person next to me <laughs> uh, when he was at CQNET. And his uh, 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 separation kernel is something quite, quite big where you ensure security of applications by having a kernel that uh, ensures uh, subjects uh, do not uh, in, uh, interact in a non authorized way. And this kernel is a small kernel in Spark that has improved absence of front-time errors, so there's no possible tax uh, of many different kinds. So just to say, it's a great project, but uh, uh, be aware that there are many others uh, uh, open source projects with these technologies. Yeah. Okay. There's one question. Well, okay, thank you. Uh, the figure about that, uh, I found that uh, the 50% I found in uh, a book, uh, I don't, I, uh, but I don't remember the title, it was about. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I'm not, so just to be clear, I'm not an expert. I'm studying this stuff right, right now for this reason. But, uh, and uh, uh, about the other initiatives, actually I was uh, in the other developer room when you talked about them. And I was happy to hear that uh, I'm not alone. <laughs> let's, uh, let's say that maybe this also has uh, a um, different flavor. The other initiative was uh, let's produce a, a separation kernel. Uh, I don't remember the, the, the other stuff. Here, the idea is uh, let's do this uh, also for a public relation stuff. So, so uh, they producing good software is also to say to the world, look, good software can be done. To try to... <laughs> so, definitely a good idea. Uh, just to say there are the things that, uh, that uh, you could look at or others could look at. For example, in terms of examples, Tokenier example was produced by Altron in Spark uh, for the NSA in 2005. Uh, we open sourced it in 2008. Everything is on the web. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, there are other others to, to look at for inspiration in that case, for as examples. By the way, I looked. Uh, I will look also uh, today. I discovered about those projects you talked about, and uh, I plan to look into them. To, for example, to see for uh, idea processes and uh, how they did that in order to import in this context. So, uh, actually, I repeat, I'm happy that they are not alone in this. <laughs> so, I, I feel a bit skeptical about the idea that uh, if you demonstrate that you can build correct software, then uh, other projects will start adopting the same methodologies. One reason is that, uh, as was pointed out, there already exists uh, software that was uh, developed uh, to be verified from the start and yet the, the methodologies are not uh, common uh, in the open source community, for example. I and sometimes I think maybe it's because the, the tools that have been used uh, in the Spark ADA community or the people that do stuff with proof assistance and so on are very different from the tools that are used in existing projects. Uh, and, and maybe what we also should do is uh, uh, start trying to adopt tools uh, for formal verification in uh, uh, important uh, open source project of today. Uh, I, I was wondering if you, you had an opinion on that because I, I, I worry, so you, you, you would uh, build a protocol implementation uh, in Sparkada, but then people could say, yeah, it works because it's Sparkada, but we are, uh, uh, I don't know, a Java shop or we, we, we use C right now, so 
uh, we cannot use this methodology. Okay, so uh, first, uh, uh, about the, um, what you said at the beginning, you see, those projects, I discovered about those projects uh, today, and they have an interest in correct software, I develop in ADA, and stuff like that. So maybe what's missing is, uh, I know that maybe uh, in this context I'm going to say a bad word, but uh, kind of marketing stuff. <laughs> so letting people to know that, uh, to actually try to spread this idea, not just, uh, because for example, those are the projects I discovered today, and I have an interest in this. So. <laughs> So just to answer it, because I, I think there's an answer. This domain, uh, these tools for, uh, for more verification, uh, higher critical software, it's very uh, open source rich. You have plenty of tools that are open source, and in particular, uh, industrial tools. So for example, if you do C, C code, uh, there's Framacy. Framacy is a well-known tool. Uh, it's not adopted very widely, because all these incur a cost, a cost. So if you, I mean, for our software, for building our own software in ADA, we don't use our sales part because it would be too costly. Uh, we'd have too many constraints to develop uh, a tool that is not as critical as, uh, as that. And so just to mention, for C, you would have from a C that, uh, that implements the same thing with the underlying uh, same building blocks, uh, in fact, from also the open source community, so open source provers. Uh, for Java, you have OpenGML, which is also open source. So you have uh, framework tools like that that are available for a few languages. Uh, I believe that for, for C code, for the, for the uh, drivers, uh, people have used Klee, for example, model checking uh, of C code. So I, I don't know the state exactly of that, but yeah, for Microsoft, there was Slam. And um, uh, well, I guess there are many, many tools, and it depends on the motivation of communities. Uh, higher critical software may require more effort, so again, it depends on the motivation of the community. Hi, um, I, I like the initiative to make a more secure uh, in infrastructure. Uh, on the other hand, I uh, just did a project on an x-ray machine and I think 60 to 70% of our product code was test code. Um, so I think the current test infrastructures, if you expand them and they get attention, we would already get there. And another lots of problems is indeed the legacy of C and C++ that, uh, that hurt us. So ADA could be a solution or Rust or I don't know what other initiatives that there are. Um, so yeah, I yeah, wish you all the luck with this initiative and I hope more do follow. Hello. Uh, I was wondering, and I don't know if you can give us some figures, uh, if, um, um, for example, I'm thinking about uh, the Linux kernel. There is a lot of critical open source software that is used uh, heavily in production nowadays, uh, and uh, I find it difficult to believe that mm, some kind of formal verification technique was not already applied on the large scale on this kind of software. Do you have some idea about uh, the, what was done already in the... In in this yeah, at the industrial level, I don't know, but you know, uh, doing formal verification on uh, uh, languages like C, so maybe I, I'm not an expert in this field, so, uh, but I think that uh, it could be 
much more difficult than using other tools because uh, C is, uh, I mean, if you want to do formal verification, you cannot use pointers. And uh, if you write a C without pointers, uh, you do not do much. Mm. <laughs> Even just passing in, uh, uh, parameters for that must be written from, uh, by a function, you cannot do that. Instead, in ADA, many of the u those user pointers are hidden by the language. So, for example, you say that this parameter is not parameter. Of course, the compiler will pass the pointer, but uh, it remains hidden. And so, it, uh, you, can, uh, you can avoid using pointer. But uh, a disclaimer, I'm not an expert in this field, so maybe... Yeah, just I, I would like to maybe put, uh, give an expert view on this one. Thank um, you. <laughs> uh, uh, pointers can be used in formal verification. The more pointers you have, the less uh, it's easy to do. And, for example, VCC is a tool uh, that uh, was produced by Microsoft Research, now is used at Amazon to uh, formally verify C code. Framacy is an open source uh, tooling that uh, is used to, for, to formally verify uh, C code uh, in industrial context. So just... Uh, uh, Open Gmail obviously is uh, used to uh, verify Java, so yeah, you can. And just to, to answer, because the, there was a, a question before on uh, languages. Languages matter a lot for these kind of things. Uh, last week, uh, uh, Xavier Leroy, uh, the creator of, of um, uh, OCaml and uh, ComCert uh, certified compiler, uh, gave a presentation uh, on on that and and yeah. He, he started, although he created this compiler from C uh, to assembly, he started by saying that C is ugly. Yes, C is ugly, and you cannot really uh, work around it. Uh, this morning, uh, or uh, the uh, person doing the presentation on software quality in Mozilla uh, just uh, urged people to move away from C++ to Rust. Uh, Xavier Roy would go to OCaml instead. Uh, I would go to Spark. Just, just know that there are uh, other alternatives than C and C++ and that the language matters if you want to go to that level. I, I was going to ask if it's um, kind of a project founded by a university. It's, frankly, I feel really sad to see such things um, occupying space in universities as a, like for um, future generations? Well, uh, so far the fund, there is no funding. More or less it's uh, me working on, uh, uh, on following uh, students who's go who are graduating and uh, uh, the amount of resources are not, uh, is not uh, huge. And by the way, I believe that uh, it's something that uh, can be uh, useful, well, okay, uh, can be important for the future. I mean, uh, having this, uh, promoting this idea and uh, also teaching students that uh, software must, uh, can and must be good because it's important and teaching them skills about how to write good software, I mean, I believe that's really important. And, uh... So thank you very much, Ricardo. Welcome.